All right, John Kegg, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. So you are a philosopher. What kind of philosophy do you specialize in? So my background is in American philosophy and 19th century European philosophy, two types of philosophy that actually American pragmatism especially says that philosophy should be judged on the basis of its practical consequences. In other words, how philosophy can matter to individuals and their communities, how, it, how basically philosophy can make a difference in life. Okay. So that's like uh, William James was a pragmatist. That's right. Yeah. So it's a, and basically there was this sense in the second half of the 19th century that philosophy risked jeopardizing its own relevance basically by retreating to the ivory tower and that it needed to basically touch down again in the world. Well, okay. So you wrote a book about the pragmatists, American philosophy, which is great, but you got a, a new book out called Hiking with Nietzsche. Now, Nietzsche is an interesting character because he was kind of doing something similar to the transcendentalist, the pragmatist, trying to make philosophy alive, right? But, but before we get into your relationship with Nietzsche, let's talk about this guy because I think a lot of, he's a very controversial figure. He's misunderstood. What do you think are the biggest misconceptions about Frederick Nietzsche? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I'm glad that you asked. So, I mean, Nietzsche is probably the gateway for many, many mostly 19-year-old men into philosophy. And that was the case for me. He's also the most misunderstood philosopher of the 19th and 20th century, maybe of all, all of philosophy. So, I mean, when we think about Nietzsche, we, we think about the bumper sticker slogans, God is dead. It, and also, what, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I think that one of the misapprehensions or the misunderstandings of Nietzsche is that when he says God is dead, he's rejoicing over this fact. <laughs> he's not. In fact, he sees the fact that we can no longer believe in traditional forms of meaning, so religious, political, familial. He thinks that during the 19th century, those forms of meaning have kind of gone down the toilet. And that's what he means when he says God is dead. He's not rejoicing. What, what, what he's saying is in the absence of these forms of traditional meaning making, what are we going to do with our lives? And he actually sees it as a crisis. So he might be an atheist in a certain way, but he's not, he's certainly not a rejoicing atheist. The second sort of misunderstanding is that Nietzsche was an anti-Semite or is the darling of the alt-right. Nietzsche was not an anti-Semite. His sister Elizabeth was, and that's how he became acquainted so intimately with the Nazi party in the 1930s and 1940s, and then in our collective memory today. But that wasn't the case in Nietzsche's day. In fact, he talks about nationalism and anti-Semitism as a type of bovine nationalism, a type of cowish nationalism, which he was not a fan of. So I think those are the two main sort of misunderstandings. But unfortunately, that's the way that many of us understand Nietzsche today. Yeah, I think you know, he, he was a friend with Wagner, or the uh, guy who wrote music, and he was an anti-Semite. And Nietzsche, that's kind of one of the reasons why he ended his friendship with him, right? Right. So, I mean, one of the, the primary reason that Nietzsche ended his friendship with Wagner is that Nietzsche had a very close relationship with a man by the name of Paul Ray. And Paul Ray was a Jew, and Wagner spread a very nasty rumor about Nietzsche. He said that Nietzsche's difficulty with his eyes could be attributed to masturbation, and his masturbation could be attributed to his fear of women, and that his fear of women could be traced to a homosexuality that he was sharing with Paul Ray. And that was a rumor that basically Nietzsche never forgave, and that that ended their relationship. Yeah, I probably wouldn't forgive people spreading false rumors of Ibachi either. So, I mean, what kind of philosophy was Nietzsche doing? Because it, it's different from, say, Plato or Aristotle or more analytic philosophers. You read his stuff, and it's like sometimes very bizarre, these aphorisms, this very bold speaking about, you know, Zarathustra and things like that. So what was, what, how would you describe Nietzsche's philosophy? Sure. I mean, it's very, that's, it's a hard question. So I think Nietzsche is trying to create a philosophy that can give us a sense of meaning in the absence of the traditions that I mentioned earlier. So what he would like us to do is to understand that the, that the death of God actually allows us to live. And living is not just an issue of reason. It's an issue of passion. It's an issue of art. And so 
that that belief then comes through in his philosophy. And his philosophy, Ralph Waldo Emerson says, one day philosophy will be done by poets. Nietzsche envisions that or is trying to embody that. So when we think about the form of Nietzsche's philosophy, we see poetry, we see aphorism, we see songs, drama. And what Nietzsche is hoping is that we actually see it as a philosophy of life. He says that the the point of life is to make our lives like pieces of art. And he tried to embody that in his writing. So it doesn't come across as a straight argument or as a rational discourse, because he says that uh, Nietzsche suspects that human beings don't just live by rational discourse alone. They live by gut instinct, and they live by aesthetic or artistic experience. And so by forming a philosophy that is, as you say, unconventional, he's going, he's trying to tap into those, you know, those ways of understanding. Yeah, that irrational part, he uses the god Dionysus, right? It's sort of that, that represents that irrational part of humanity. That's right. I mean, it, and so Nietzsche envisions a culture that balances the Dionysian and the Apollonian, the Apollonian being this call to order and the Dionysian being this sort of darker instinctual impulse. And he says that the best cultures are those that can have a balance between the two. And if we think and and have a balance between the two in the same experience, that's what he thinks so is so unique about Greek tragedy, for example. So you mentioned Ralph Waldo Emerson there. As I've read Nietzsche, I've found similarities between like what he was doing, what the transcendentalists were doing. What do you think were the similarities there? Yeah. So, I mean, Nietzsche is reading Emerson through the 1860s, and he says that Emerson is his good friend because of his deep, what Nietzsche calls skepsis, the word that gives us skeptical. In other words, Emerson's doubt about conventional forms of morality, his doubt about conventional or traditional ways of being. And I think that that's a similarity. I also think there's a similarity with Emerson's sort of drive toward individualism and self-reliance, which we see in Nietzsche. So if you think about Nietzsche's understanding of the will to power, the idea that we are most alive when we exercise our wills in sort of creative or meaningful ways, this was in Emerson as well. And so that's another aspect. I also think that Nietzsche, Nietzsche's notion, he, he describes it as the amor fati, the love of fate. And I think that we see this in Emerson as well. And we can talk about the love of fate a little later too. I'm sure we will. Sure. You just mentioned Will to Power. I mean, that's one of the books that I feel like people associate, the reason why people associate Nietzsche with Nazism, because that was like got it. The, the book that, you know, all the, the soldiers, uh, Nazi American carried around. But like, People, when they hear will to power, they often think, well, he's talking about political power. It sounds like there, you were just talking about Nietzsche wasn't really talking about political power or just dominance. He was talking more some uh, like a personal type of power. Um, yeah, I mean, Nietzsche is asking us to, uh, he says this to us, and I'm going to be just very, as frank as I can about it. Sure. He says, the young soul should look back on his life or her life. And ask, ask themselves, what have you really loved up to this point? And the will to power is one way of answering that question. Like what we find about our lives that are, you know, are the best parts of our lives are times when we're exercising the will to power, this creative force. And you're right, it is individual and not necessarily nationalistic or imperialistic. There is another way of answering that question, what have you loved up till now? But I think that the will to power is one, is the traditional way that we understand Nietzsche as answering that question. So what we love is moments in which we feel like our volition is exercised in you know, active ways or in ways that we have authorship over. And Nietzsche was very much attuned to the fact that human beings do feel good when they feel powerful. Right. I think he, yeah, he said something like joy is the feeling of power increasing or something right. along that line. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, he's also coming out of this uh, Darwinian legacy. Darwin publishes The Origin of Species in 18, or 1859. And Nietzsche is reading this and trying to figure out what a naturalized morality would look like. In other words, what would morality look like if we just think about humans as just another form of animal? 
And that doesn't mean that he's reducing us to animals. Rather, he's, he's saying, what are our natures actually like? And where do we find joy? Where do we find it? Well, one place we find it is power. So you mentioned at the beginning that oftentimes Nietzsche is the, the gateway to philosophy for 19-year-old young men. And you were one of those young men. You started reading and writing about him when you're 19 years old as a college student. What drew you to Nietzsche as a young man? Sure. I mean, my, my background is fairly conservative. I grew up in the middle of Pennsylvania, central Pennsylvania. And if you've ever been there, you probably know that like central Pennsylvania is not a place where people think, you know, it's not, not, not a bastion of philosophy. My mother, a a fairly conservative woman, never envisioned her son becoming a philosophy professor. I grew up in a sort of strict Calvinist religious setting and which is not unlike Frederick Nietzsche. He grew up a strict Lutheran. And when I read Nietzsche's Antichrist, a a book that was published at the end of his life, it says, one must have the courage to ask forbidden questions. And I was hooked uh, because those forbidden questions were questions like, is there a God? Do I have faith? What does it mean to be a man? Those are questions that Nietzsche invites us to ask. And he doesn't give us answers, but rather he just says, go ahead, you know, take the risk. And so I was hooked. Thankfully, I bumped into a very good professor, two of them, Dan Conway and Doug Anderson, who um, encouraged me to write a thesis on Emerson and Nietzsche on the concepts of genius, insanity, and what's known as the ascetic ideal, not the aesthetic, but the ascetic ideal. Asceticism being the idea of self-deprivation or self-control. And anyway, they, they were the ones who uh, said to me after my junior year, they handed me a, an envelope and in that envelope was $3,000. And they said, you know what? You've never been out of, outside of central Pennsylvania. You should go to Switzerland. You should go, quote, hike with Nietzsche. And that's how the journey sort of began. So you went on this hike. You went to Switzerland to dig deeper into Nietzsche. Let's talk about Switzerland. What role did Switzerland play in Nietzsche's life, or particularly this town? I guess Basel or Basel? Well, Basel was the town where Nietzsche became the youngest tenured professor in philology, uh, the study of languages. Basel actually was a place that he escaped into the mountains in 1880. And then from 1881 to 1886, he spent his summers in a very small town called Sils Maria on the Italian border. And he stayed at a boarding house, which is now a museum. And my professors, Doug and Dan, had contacted the museum and had arranged for me to stay there on this first 19-year-old journey. And I stayed there for nine weeks and hiked the trails that Nietzsche had hiked. It was also the place where Nietzsche, he basically escaped the sort of conventions of academic philosophy from Basel and began to write books that at the time seemed unconventional to the point of craziness but really transformed contemporary philosophy. So books like Thus Spoke Zarathustra, Beyond Good and Evil, these books uh, were penned not not in an office, but in in the hills outside of Sils Maria. So you mentioned that Nietzsche went there to hike. He was a walker, like he, and even wrote about walking. What did, what did Nietzsche say about walking? Yeah, he said, well, he said many things, one of which was, The only thoughts worth having are the ones that you have on your feet. I judge a thought on its ability to walk. In other words, to carry its own weight. And Nietzsche, when when he first got there, and many on many occasions through his early stay in Sils Maria, would hike seriously. He had a favorite mountain, Mount Corvach or Piz Corvach. But through his later life, this walking became more of a way of, you know, it it was more strolling rather than hiking because his health was so bad. And he would take companions, many of whom were women and many of whom, or a couple of whom were Jewish. Another sort of misconception about Nietzsche is that he's a misogynist, straight misogynist, that he, that he hates women and that he's an anti-Semite. Well, in the, in the hills around Sils Maria, he spent a lot of time with a feminist and with a Jewish woman. I mean, he comes out of this long line of philosophers that, you know, thought on their feet. So Aristotle, Aristotle had a school of thought known as the peripatetics and the walkers. Rousseau said that his study was in fact his walking trail. 
And then there's Thoreau. Right. <laughs> I mean, he was like this epic walker. There's Kant too. And your wife, I think, is an expert in Kant. Yeah. That guy, like people would like supposedly would people would set their clocks to his walking schedule. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I mean, I've often poo-pooed it. So Immanuel Kant lived in Konigsberg, a part of Prussia. And people would joke around in Konigsberg that you could see the sort of philosopher stroll the same time every day. And I always thought that this was, a, you know, and Nietzsche thought that this was a reflection of a constipated mind, that you would never, <laughs> like you would just do the same thing over and over again. But the more I get into adult, adulthood, I think maybe this is the best that some of us can do. Like, I, I, like, we're not going to the Alps. A lot of us are not going to the Alps, right? Maybe we should just go for a little walk like Kant. And Kant, I think, has, I mean, Carol has helped me see this, that Kant has the idea of what he calls a purposeless purpose on his walks. He thinks that we should embody a purposeless purpose when we're trying to experience art or beauty, or the sublime. Because usually our life is filled with these purposes that, you know, we raise children or we, you know, have a house or we buy stuff. Those are real purposes. What's, what's rare about Kant's walks is they give him just a little space to have a purposeless purpose. And I think that that's something useful in our sort of rat race of a life. I mean, I'm curious, have you, what do you think it is about walking? In your own experience, right? We're going to get phenomenological here. Sure. Yeah. Uh, your own experience with walking. Why do you think it it lends itself well to philosophy or thinking through ideas? That's great. I mean, one thing is that walking is the most primary way of orienting ourselves in the world. So, I mean, when you walk through a woods or when you walk through a city, your feet are doing something for you. In other words, they're they they're allowing you to explore the world. We usually don't even think about it. But when you go on a real walk, you realize you're exploring the world, which is in fact what I think philosophy is meant to do as well. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is when you walk, you get to get away. In other words, we have so many habitual or mundane moments in our life. Philosophy, or rather walking, allows us to escape, if for only a little while. Like we make fun of, you know, pedestrian is a word that we usually use to describe the most boring aspects of life, but maybe we should be pedestrians. Like in other words, maybe we should just walk a little bit more, get out of our, get out of our, you know, in the house ruts. So I think that's another aspect. No, I like that. Yeah. There's that Latin phrase, solvitar abulando, like it is solved by walking. You know, sometimes like you got a problem, you just go for a walk and you might not get the answer there, but usually you, I do because you're just your brain is sort of resting and then insights come. Right, that's right. And I, I mean, it doesn't have to be something. I, for a long time, I thought that walking and hiking had to be this sort of heroic exercise of masculine power. And as I've gotten gone gray, slowly gone gray, I realized that this is a sort of futile pursuit. Like you are, it, it, you can push yourself, and I guess there is some sort of benefit to that. But I think the real difficulty is to come to terms with the ways that you can't always exert yourself. Right. So also on that first trip to Switzerland, when you were hiking where Nietzsche hiked, you were also doing some like extreme forms of fasting. What was going on? What were you hoping to do with that? Yeah. This is a moment in the book where I'm like, am I going to write this? Am I really going to write this? And I did. So... When I was 19, I was writing about the ascetic ideal. The ascetic ideal is the idea that we have the power to deprive ourselves of things. And in fact, that this is a form of self-control. Fasting is like a perfect example of ascetic practice. Nietzsche has a criticism of the ascetic ideal when it's placed in the context of Christianity. If you think about the priest or the one who fasts um, in Christianity, they're, they're typically thinking that they're going to fast in order to, well, go to heaven or in order to be, you know, sainted or something. Nietzsche doesn't believe that. And he thinks that that story is actually pretty destructive. But what I noticed about Nietzsche's life is that he was not, he did not have an unvexed relationship with food. It was difficult for him to eat. He had stomach problems. So when I went to Switzerland, I wanted to play around. No, well, at first I was playing around with it, 
but it turns out that fasting is pretty addictive. And we, uh, we talk about men typically as fasting and women as having anorexia, but I think that's a pretty stupid distinction. I, I mean, straight up, I just had, an, had a pretty serious eating disorder, which I think many wrestlers and many swimmers, which I was one, end up with. And I came back and came back from Switzerland and have been struggling with an eating disorder the rest of my life. Wow. So you mentioned, uh, you know, he, Nietzsche wasn't a fan of the aesthetic ideal within the context of Christianity, but he, he did see value. Like what did, what value did he see in it then? If he didn't think it will, you, you don't do it to sanctify yourself. Yeah. I mean, this idea of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I think that Nietzsche was suggesting that we come to understand our limits through forms of very extreme practice. And this is the exercising of the will to power, oftentimes. Uh, if you think about endurance athletes, or if you think about extreme sports, or if you think about forms of fasting, they're all efforts to get a hold of yourself, to sort of see your limits, and to author something of your life, to sort of um, to own up to part of your life. If you, I mean, I'm also a, a sort of long distance runner. And when you're running long distances, anything for me, anything over 10 miles, I want to stop. Like there's a part of me that wants to stop and just continuing to go is an exercising of the, you know, is an exercise of the will. And Nietzsche thought that we come to know ourselves through those sort of moments. So that sort of is a quick answer to your question. Yeah. Yeah. So, and also while you were there, it sounds like you were having some uh, mental health issues. I mean, there was a moment that you're on the cliff and you stare down over a cliff and you're thinking, what if I could jump? I think everyone's done that at some point where you know, you're driving oncoming traffic. It's like, if I just swerved. But do you think something else was going on? Or do you think you were kind of descending into the abyss yeah. with while you were hi- hiking with Nietzsche? I mean, when Nietzsche says to you, you must have the strength to ask forbidden questions, he's also saying like the most forbidden question is the question of why. Why bother doing anything? Why bother getting up in the morning? Why? And when he strips, I mean, when he strips traditional answers away from you, that why can be very scary. So for example, if my minister or if my rabbi or if my mother or father are no longer the guiding forces of my life, then what is? I mean, Camus, who sort of inherits the existential mantle from Nietzsche, Camus writing in the the, the 1940s, says there is but one serious philosophical question, and that is suicide. He doesn't mean to bum you out. He's just saying to you, what's the point of life? Is life worth living? And I think coming up with really good answers to that question is difficult, or at least it was for me. Sometimes it still is. No, yeah. I think everyone has that has have had those moments that where they're like laying in bed at night and you're like, what are, what am I doing? <laughs> yeah, what 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 am I doing? <laughs> right. Like it's just like what what the heck am I doing? And I think that Nietzsche allows you to voice those concerns, which is good, but it can also be very disturbing. Now you might ask yourself, why is it good? I think Thoreau is better on this. He says, I don't want to get to the end of my life and discover that I haven't lived. And I think that that the scariest part of death is getting to the end and discovering that you haven't lived. And one of the hardest parts is to get to the end and then look back and think, oh my God, what was I doing with all of my time? I didn't have that much of it. Man, did I squander it. And I think Nietzsche wakes us up when he asks us to ask forbidden questions. He's trying to wake us up to help us avoid that. Uh, you know, that end of life, right? Well, another thing he came up with, sort of a thought experiment to get you thinking about that is eternal return. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so he says to you, he says, imagine that in your loneliest of lonelies, a demon comes to you and says that this moment, this very moment and all things, you will have to live over not once, not twice, but an infinite number of times. And then he asks, the demon asks, would this idea crush you or would it elevate your soul? And most of the time, I think it crushes us. The idea that I'd have to redo this moment again exactly the same way an infinite number of times is terrifying. Think about all the time you're stuck in traffic or all the time that you're in a bad relationship. You'd have to live that over infinitely. 
So Nietzsche is asking us to own up to life with a type of radical responsibility. In other words, can you live your life, as William Butler Yeats says, and do it all again? Live it, play it again, like play it again, Sam. And I think that that's a challenge that many of us would do well to sort of face up to. And then you also talk about, you mentioned earlier, amor fati, like this love of fate that kind of walks hand in hand with that idea as well. Yeah. So, I mean, for, for a long period of time, I thought the only way to answer the eternal return, to answer this demon, is to exercise your power, to exercise the will to power. But I realized, especially on this second trip to Switzerland and at the age of 37, I realized that life, adult life, really doesn't consist in exercising your will to power, or at least not primarily. It, it um, consists quite a bit in the times when your will to power fails you, or you exercise the will to power in disastrous or really embarrassing or heinous ways. And the question then is, how are you going to embrace the eternal return and admit to yourself that you are deeply fallible, that your life is deeply fallible. And I think Nietzsche is coming to the end of his life and discovering something. He says, we must embrace the amor fati, the love of fate. The love of fate says that we are to love, not just bear, but love the things that we find most despicable, embarrassing, or heinous about ourselves. Like maybe the whole, maybe the hardest part about the eternal return is, is the things that we do to ourselves and do to others that we're not proud of. And coming to terms and owning up to those things is, I think, part and parcel of the amor fati. And I think it's a really pretty mature way of thinking about adult life. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's not like you're not being fatalistic or nihilistic. It's like, well, nope. I can't do anything. Like, you, you have will to power. You can exercise it. But there's some parts, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. So don't, don't beat yourself up too hard about it. I mean, there's this moment at the end of Nietzsche's life where he, where he says, I must look back on my sickest years with, a, with deep gratitude. They have allowed me to become who I am, namely a philosopher. But the idea that we would be able to look back on the sort, sort of the hardest years of our life and to say, this too, like I would have that, you know, repeat infinitely. That's the time. I mean, that strength is not straightforwardly the will to power. It's something a little different. But if you've been born into a family that that sometimes you'd think to yourself like, man, this was not of my choosing or into circumstances that were not of your choosing, maybe we have to exercise the amor fati, not the, not the will to power. Well, maybe this, those two concepts combine in that idea that Nietzsche, uh, you know, he quoted Pindar, you know, you got to become who you are. Good. Isn't that sort of yeah. like a combination, a synthesis of, of you know, will to power and amor fati? I think, I think so. So, I mean, if you think about the idea of becoming who you are, it sounds pretty paradoxical because you already are who you are in one way. Or if you become somebody else, then what has happened to the person that you once were? It's, it's kind of this cone-like riddle. But I think what Nietzsche is suggesting is that we have to think about ourselves as the process of becoming. In other words, being somebody is not becoming the person that you always wanted to become, always wanted to be. Like the you does not exist out there somewhere for all time and you discover it and then you become it for all time. That's not how human beings live or die. We just change or we're transfigured. And to figure out a way where we're both the authors of our lives, but also willing to own up to whatever happens, those are the two aspects, the will to power and the amor fati. I think that that's Nietzsche's point with become who you are. Yeah. We, I like that idea of becoming. Like, that's when Nietzsche was talking about. He says, I am dynamite. I am dynamis. I am change. I'm always becoming. Right. And so, and this idea... Usually we just, we think about dynamite, its roots being in the Greek power. It's not, I don't think that that's quite right. I think he meant to, to become who you are. He says, you must not have the slightest idea of who you are, which is strange. In other words, you, you have to let yourself go. It is many times who we are in life is we're clinging to the self. 
we're clinging to the ideas about what we think we should become or what we think we are. And Nietzsche says, let it go. See what else will happen. See what change will occur. And I think that that's, that's a pretty useful thought for those of us who are edging, you know, 40 or 50. Right. Well, you, so you mentioned you went back to Switzerland as a 37-year-old man. You, uh, this time you brought along your wife and your young daughter. What were you hoping to learn by going hiking with Nietzsche again as, as, <laughs> I, as, as in midlife? I honestly didn't know. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I, I think I look back on the decision to go again. And my partner, Carol, still says to me, she goes, you know, like that was the smartest and dumbest thing we have ever done. And she's right. And because I think what I wanted to see when I initially went back was if I could sort of live as intensely as I did when I was 19. Could I still climb the same mountains? Could we still do? And the, the answer is an unequivocal no. Like you can't do that, especially when you have a wife and child. And so what, what I tried to come to terms with is growing up. In other words, I had to take the gondola to the top of the mountain with, with Becca and Carol instead of hiking up by myself. And instead of being angry or resigned to this fact, the challenge is to own up to it, to see if you can love it, even the frustration of it. So I didn't know what I was going to find, but what I found was honestly an appreciation for the Amor Fati, which I didn't have as a 19-year-old. Right, and you were becoming who you are, which is now at this point you're a middle aged guy with a wife and a kid. Yeah, that's right. And and honestly, the the point of in in part of part of this is to give an interpretation of Nietzsche that allows one or allows a reader to see Nietzsche's brilliance in leading us into middle age. Usually, he's regarded as the quintessential juvenile philosopher. Nineteen year olds are drawn to him, but you're supposed to get out of it when you turn twenty five or thirty. But I think Nietzsche provides resources for us to really think through our lives as we move toward death. And I think that that's what the book is about. So, no, yeah, I think so. I'm, so I'm 36, I'm approaching middle age. And you notice, yeah, opportunities start closing down, right? You, there's some things you can no longer do because of simply just time or you, you're, you have responsibilities. And for a lot of people that can be, they have that sort of moment. It's like, oh my gosh, they have midlife crisis. They do these crazy things. But Nietzsche would say, no, you know, chill out. Yes, things are closing in. Your opportunities are going down maybe a bit, but you still have a bit. You have, you have the choice to, to love it and to embrace it, but also there's still wiggle room within that, those parameters. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that wiggle room is especially important. So, I mean, Nietzsche talks a big game about being a, he calls himself a hyperborean, or rather he says a hyperborean are like these mythical creatures that live up at the top of mountain, like frost covered, you know, ice covered mountains. Nietzsche was never this person ever. Uh, He was generally pretty sickly, especially when he's writing these words. And it's a hope that you have a little bit of wiggle room to be the hyperborean in your mundane life. In other words, see if you can wiggle yourself free, even within the sort of habitualness of your life. Um, and I think that that's a really interesting sort of you know value added to reading Nietzsche as a forty-year-old. I'm I'm just on the brink of forty. It's like we talk about Nietzsche's Ubermensch, this classic overman, this ideal of individual freedom, and it's very appealing to a nineteen-year-old or to a 21 year old. And what is interesting is that it just, it, it fits so well with their natural, like with their natural sense of vigor. Maybe the Ubermensch is better, is more, is more useful to those of us who have forgotten their free impulses. In other words, who have hit 40 or 50, maybe the Ubermensch is a lingering promise that we can be otherwise than we currently are. And I think that that's what Nietzsche gives us. That's an interesting point. Yeah, when you're 21, like it's not really hard to strive, exactly. but when you're 50, it becomes harder. But so it's there. You're like, oh, I can still do that. There's that possibility. Right, exactly. And I think we forget about the mad possibilities of life as we get older. But we have to remember that the mad, uh, that the mad possibilities of life don't necessarily involve the same types of actions as they did when you were 19. The mad possibilities could be 
okay, my daughter, my daughter has to, you know, my daughter has a snow day in this polar vortex, right? And I can be pissed off about that and think, oh, geez, I'm not going to get work done. Or I can go out and do something beautiful with her. It is up to me. And th- those are little, that's, that's the wiggle room I'm talking about. It, do you want to dig yourself in the igloo with your daughter? Or do you want to be pissed off all day that you have to, you know, that you're not getting the work done that you think you need to do? No, I love it. So yeah, look for those wiggle rooms throughout life. That's the thing. I think a lot of times people look at Nietzsche and you, got, you think you have to do something grandiose and giant and big. Because he talked like that. He talked a big game. But like if you look at his life, I mean, he wrote some philosophy, some books that like, you know, have changed the way we think. But he kind of, I mean, he was, he, he read a lot. He walked, he slept. I mean, he didn't do too much, but he still had that idea that was there that he strived for. No, he's deeply human. Like he's deeply human. At the same time, he's striving after something deep and transcendent. And I think that that's what we need to remember because uh, oftentimes life is so mundane and like it's so boring. And Nietzsche says, we are wasting our lives if we just are satisfied with this. But you don't necessarily need to go. I learned that you don't need to go to the Alps (laughs) in order to break out of that. And I don't think that I'm going to be going to the Alps again. (laughs) Right. You can just build an igloo with your daughter. uh, Yeah. Honestly. I mean, it sounds stupid, but it's, it's, it is true. I think. Well, John, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to learn more about the book and your work? Well, the publisher is Friar Strauss and Giroux, but honestly, I think a lot of the pieces that I've written in the New York Times and in the Los Angeles Review of Books lately have resonated with these questions. The book is out in the UK next month, and I think that I'm going to be posting a number of interviews through the BBC and ABC in the next couple of months. But I really do appreciate the chance to talk to you. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks again. My guest today was John Kegg. He's the author of the book, Hiking with Nietzsche, on Becoming Who You Are. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can also find out more information about his work at his website, johnkegg.com. That's John Kegg. That's K-A-A-G.com. Also, check out our show notes at aom.is slash kegg, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic. 